The story behind Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon is already kinda legendary. Originally designed as his attempt to make a Star Wars movie, it was a little too dark for Lucasfilm and they turned it down, leading to him going to Netflix and making his own version of a Star Wars movie. And I gotta say, Rebel Moon is a total blast. There is a difference between justice and revenge. There is a price to pay for your defiance. One woman. I do love this part. So this one takes place in a dark corner of the universe, one might even say a galaxy far, far away, that's controlled by a fascist regime called the Mother World. A former soldier named Cora, played by Sofia Butella, tries to escape her past by living as a simple farmer on a peaceful moon called the Velt. When that moon is invaded by the Mother World and her friends are threatened, Cora sets off to recruit an army of soldiers to do battle with the Mother World and end their tyranny once and for all. So, okay, what does this movie sound like? Sounds pretty much like Star Wars, right? Well, it is. It's basically the Magnificent Seven meets Star Wars, or rather, Seven Samurai meets Star Wars, or like a hyper big budget version of Battle Beyond the Stars, a sci fi epic from the early 80s that I truly feel not enough people have seen, but clearly Zack Snyder has. Mix it in with a heavy helping of heavy metal, both the magazine and the film, and you end up with something like Rebel Moon. While a bit overstuffed, Snyder maybe made it a little too lean at it running just over two hours, it's nonetheless pretty deliriously entertaining and an epic one could easily call the best Star Wars movie never made. In fact, it's not a stretch to say that Rebel Moon is more entertaining than anything that's come out of the galaxy far, far away in quite some time. You see, for a long while, Star Wars, Marvel, and a lot of other big franchises have had the handicap of relying way too much on their ever-expanding mythologies. Rather than being something that makes them extra appealing, it's become a weight that's kind of weighed them down, and I think that's why we're getting superhero fatigue and Star Wars fatigue. You really kind of have to do your homework in order to enjoy the latest Star Wars or Marvel movie or TV series, but not so with Rebel Moon. All you need to know is set up in a quick introduction, and Snyder embraces the same simple direct style of storytelling that made those classics I mentioned earlier in the review so exciting to watch. While some will indeed slam it as derivative, and one can certainly see how it was initially planned as a Star Wars movie, Snyder's also delivered a pretty damn exciting film. It's full of slow motion action, heroes' journeys, at least seven of them actually, operatic betrayals, star crossed romance, and everything that defines the space opera genre. For about 15 minutes or so, the lightning quick pace of the storytelling isn't bit overwhelming, and Snyder's made the, perhaps the fastest paced movie of his career. But by the time the credits rolled, I was dying to see part two, The Scar Giver, which Snyder promises is coming sooner rather than later. The movie is anchored by a star-making performance by Sofia Butella. While she's been in loads of stuff, she's never gotten this kind of showcase. Her Cora is a classic dark heroine, with her embracing the character's vulnerability to give her a much needed edge. Often the problem with heroes in movies these days is that they're presented as too invulnerable. I mean, when do you ever see somebody like Vin Diesel in Fast and Furious or a Jason Statham character, or even kind of Daisy Ridley's Rey in the Star Wars movie ever lose a fight. They're just badasses right from the start, and that kind of makes them a little bit dull because you always know how it's going to go. There's nothing fun about an action hero that wins every fight. I know the studios are trying to make that kind of empowering in some ways, but there's nothing empowering about somebody who's invulnerable. Cora is more from the Sarah Connor or Ripley mold, or one could even say the Sylvester Stallone mold where this hero isn't afraid to take their licks. She's a badass, but she isn't physically or emotionally invulnerable. This gives her action scenes extra oomph, as you don't always know what's going to happen during them, or how she's going to escape. While definitely Butella's movie, she's surrounded by a very solid cast of heroes and villains, all of whom play these classic archetypes, but with a lot of style. Ed Skrine as evil incarnate as Admiral Noble, the right-hand man to this movie's version of Emperor Palpatine, Farfis Belisarius, with him leering in delight as he wreaks havoc across the galaxy. Snyder's movie is definitely more skewed towards the heroes than the villains, though and the collection he's assembled here, while very much in the Magnificent Seven mode, are a fun bunch. Michel Huisman initially plays the whippiest of the bunch, being a peaceful farmer without any experience in war. He could have been deadly dull, but Snyder does give him solid motivation, as he has an unscrupulous side that inadvertently made his people vulnerable to the mother world. He also has this heroic streak that starts to come out as the movie goes on, 
and Snyder gives him one of the movie's best badass moments, establishing him as a legit hero for the second film. Stasner plays a character heavily patterned on Charles Bronson in The Magnificent Seven, while Dunabe's nemesis is a lot like James Coburn's character in that same movie. They play heroes with dark pasts and need of redemption, with Nair looking like a Frank Frazetta illustration come to life. Damon Hunsu steals scenes as a former mother world general turned drunk, while Snyder fave Ray Fisher and Cleopatra Coleman play the Blood Axes, a brother and sister pair who lead the resistance against the mother world. And of course, there's also Charlie Hunnam as the movie's answer to Han Solo, Kai, an anti-hero whose entrance into the film is a direct riff on the cantina scene in Star Wars. Sporting a grill and an Irish accent, Hunnam is having a whale of a time playing a charming rogue with dubious motivations beyond cash. Again, it's an archetype, but a well-executed one. Of the entire cast, though, the most intriguing character is one who's barely featured in this installment, but is said to be one of the leads in the next film, a robotic knight named Jimmy. Voiced by Anthony Hopkins and performed by Dustin Tate Hammer, he's part of an ancient order of robots who are no longer able to kill, but finds himself able to pull the trigger when needed after developing a paternal interest in a young girl on the veldt who's attacked by soldiers. Next to Korra, his hero's quest is the most affecting, and I'm eager to see the director's cut of this, which apparently has a lot of footage involving the character that was removed to tighten the pace. Visually, the film is impeccably mounted, as long as you like Snyder's style in the first place, that is, and I was lucky enough to see it on a massive theatrical screen. And it feels like Netflix has maybe erred in not giving this a more robust release given how underwhelming this season's crop of blockbusters is turning out to be. With everybody talking about how Aquaman 2 was bound to flop and not being totally interested in seeing Timothée Chalamet as Wonka, maybe a sprawling space epic would have been well served to come out on the big screen. But alas, it's showing up on Netflix and I think a lot of people are gonna watch it. The score by Junkie Excel is suitably epic and the action scenes are pretty dazzling with the movie ending on a more satisfying note than the majority of films that are split in two. While Rebel Moon isn't perfect due to the fact that Snyder is perhaps a little too liberal in pulling from his influences to make his space epic, no one can deny how much of a blast it is to watch. Granted, if you're not already a Zack Snyder fan, or you don't like his style, this really isn't going to be the movie for you. But if you like his work, Rebel Moon is one of his better movies and a nifty start to what could be a very valuable franchise for Netflix. I give this a strong 8 out of 10.